we have built our cities around water. Water to drink, water to enable transport. Water sustains life, water enables growth, but it also comes with significant risk and uncertainty. <clears throat> Since 1980, we have had 28 major flooding events, 38 tropical cyclone events. Each one of those has resulted in over a billion dollars in damage. In 2017, we had 14, sorry, we had five major hurricanes, um, and that's just in the North Atlantic. <clears throat> so given these realities, what approaches can we take to build cities that can be more resilient? Traditionally, we've managed water infrastructure by figuring out what we need to do, and our approaches are predicated on our understanding of future conditions. Civil engineers are always trying to predict the future, and we build with acceptable risk. Now, we frequently have events that we think are unexpected. A civil engineer will tell you, oh, that's not unexpected. That's just unlikely or rare. Hurricane Harvey was a 500-year event. These are the things we talk about. This is how we describe these things to ourselves. Superstorm Sandy was a ten, one in 10,000 year event. Hurricanes never head in that direction. We've never seen an event in the North Atlantic this large, this far north. These events are rare. And those of us that build cities, we have ways of quantifying this uncertainty. The really key thing when you hear anything about the frequency of events is that we assume that we understand the behavior of the underlying systems. So when you hear these kinds of things, think about, do we really understand the behavior of the underlying systems? And we have ways of talking about this in uh, civil engineering. We talk about return periods. So you'll hear, oh, that was a 100-year event, or it had a 1% probability of happening um, in any given year. The question we have today is, what if we don't? fundamentally understand the underlying system. What do we build then? So before I get into a specific example, um, I want to talk a little bit about outcomes. Ultimately, cities are all about outcomes. They're the things that we expect. Cities are built for people. People expect to have clean water. People expect to be safe from flooding. Further, we expect to be able to do things like go boating and fishing, swimming at the beach. These are all reasonable things to do, and, and we should expect to be able to do them. But you guys don't think about outcomes. What you think about is cities should just work. And most importantly, we have a right to live with dignity, and we have a right to live in safe, healthy, thriving communities. So I'm going to jump into an example. How can we think about these problems differently? What might we be able to do? And I want to talk about a specific place in a specific point in time. It's one that you're probably very familiar with from recent events. Ormond Beach, Florida is located just north of Daytona Beach on the east coast of Florida. If you go there, there's a residential community. It's about 550 acres, houses. It looks like a typical subdivision in, uh, in Florida. Um, when it rains, water hits the homes, it hits the pavement, and it runs off. It runs off into a series of five large lakes. And this isn't atypical of Florida. And when it rains, that lake system fills up. And traditionally, historically, what's happened is that when the water reaches a certain level, a series of pumps kick on. There's not a lot of gravity in Florida. It's very flat. A series of pumps kick on and start to pump that facility out to the ocean to minimize flooding. Now imagine that you live in Ormond Beach, and it's September 20, uh, 2017, and Hurricane Irma is just off the south um, side of Florida, and it's approaching. And you remember in 2009, when your neighborhood had significant flooding, and you had to evacuate. You take a moment flipping back between CNN and the Weather Channel to look outside your window. And you notice something extraordinary, something you haven't seen before. The storm hasn't arrived yet, 
and yet the lakes outside your window are a couple of feet lower than they were a couple of hours earlier. You realize that the system that you rely on to protect your home and family is acting before the storm has ever arrived. So this is a dramatic change from what you've seen in the past. So this is an opportunity, it's an example of systems being able to act before things occur rather than traditionally in response to them. And it's not just about, this is a view of uh, Irma, this is literally what it looked like at that moment I described. Pretty scary place to be. You're located on the number two. Um, so it's not really just about Ormond Beach though, is it? These problems are worldwide. This is an example of a facility in Beckley, West Virginia, Little Beckley. Um, but it's an example of systems that are able to act on their own in advance in the way that I described. They watch the weather and they can take action without people in the loop. And this isn't fundamentally revolutionary. We've been able, people have been able to take these types of actions in real time by watching the weather on large projects, hydroelectric dams. It's not that we haven't been able to operate Lake Mead effectively for a long time, looking at climate and weather or large flood control facilities, but they require people to be there and to make these decisions. And technology has enabled us not to be able to just do this as a very rare kind of human-involved activity, but it allows us to take hundreds, thousands, even millions of subcomponents of our cities and weave them together, integrate intelligence, and to get very different outcomes, as I talked about. And indeed, around the country, at this very moment, there are 65 million gallons of storage in 21 states that are operating like this. Just five years ago, every one of those facilities was passive. There weren't any people making decisions. There wasn't a technological way for using those systems more effectively. And it's pretty stunning. This just shows what these things look like. They're actually pretty basic out in the field. But as I said, the outcomes are the most important part. This is a large facility thinking on its own um, during a recent rainfall in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. But I want you to think bigger. So this is just, you know, water, it's just cities, but this way of thinking, the ability to act in advance instead of just reacting to what happens. We now have the technology to take this intelligence, this thoughtfulness, our engagement around outcomes, and directly build it into the way our cities operate or other processes operate. And then lastly, I just wanna leave you with the thought, we may not know what the future holds, but we can build cities to adapt to our collective uncertain future. Thank you. <laughs>